What's up, everybody? It's your boy B. Scott with the Philadelphia Eagles. I just want to thank you all for tuning in. Don't forget to subscribe to the show and leave a five-star rating. Fly, Eagles, fly. Thanks for tuning in to the Eagles Brawl of the Brawl Network. However, you're listening on iHeartRadio, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. We appreciate you guys tuning in. Johnny Page with me, my co-host. Johnny, it's great to be back in the booth. We have a special guest that I want you brought on. And you, you told me, like, yeah, we got to have Ryan on and uh, talk all 22, talk Chip, talk Peterson offense, team with. So I'll let you take it away, but... Uh, we appreciate you guys tuning in. Keep up the five star ratings and the, the good reviews. We appreciate it. Yeah, so I'll let Ryan sort of formally introduce himself. But for those of you that never read the Chip Wagon blog, uh, probably about five, we were just talking off air about three, four years ago. I think it, it sort of stops obviously when Chip went. But for me personally, uh, I've read Ryan's blog. Literally, I'm, I'm pretty sure I can say I've read every single post he's ever written on the Chip Wagon. Um, he sort of introduced me in many ways to sort of learning about the All 22, learning about the game. And then we've sort of kept in touch on Twitter for about the past six years. I did try and get him on a pod about two, three years ago. And we sort of formally agreed. And then that all went by the wayside so I can honestly say I'm incredibly excited to sort of pick his brain because he doesn't write as much now he's a busy man so I haven't really got a chance to talk as much with him recently so we're going to pick his brain today we're going to let him uh, do a bit of talking we'll give him a few good questions and I think uh, I will as well as all the listeners will learn a, a hell of a lot from Ryan so Ryan what is it you do at the moment we're trying to talk about how to introduce you because you're a man of many talents so ha- yeah yeah I know that First of all, thanks guys for having me on, and thanks Johnny for reconnecting. It's uh, it's always a pleasure to read your stuff as well, and, and thanks for the kind words. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think my history for people that don't know it is as it relates to Eagles football. Is uh, you know, been an Eagles fan for for many many years, but you know, I started writing about the Eagles uh, on the blog called the Chip Wagon, which kind of started when Chip Kelly joined the Eagles. I was kind of fascinated, like many were, about you know what he was going to bring to the pro game and. Uh, kind of watched them quite a bit at Oregon and kind of wanted to kind of share what I knew and kind of just, it kind of took off from there. And, you know, a lot of people followed it. A lot of people seemed to like it. So I kept writing. Uh, I didn't really plan to end it when Chip left. Um, You know, I thought there was lots of good things we could still talk about, but, you know, life gets in the way and change jobs. I work kind of in the business intelligence uh, world, uh, specifically in pharmaceutical and healthcare. And so I just, right around the time that Chip left coincided with me leaving uh, and and joining a a different company and life gets busy, got family and kids. And so just couldn't keep up with the the, the regular writing. But uh, since then, you know, I've done some contributions to Bleeding Green Nation, you know, worked with um, Brandon Lee Gowton over the years on that, which was, was great. And then uh, most recently, you'll you'll find my writing on, uh, and I haven't done anything for them for much of the same reasons in the last uh, year or so, but I also contributed to The Athletic uh, uh, of Philadelphia. And so you can find some of my pieces on there as well. But great, great to be on here. And thanks. Uh, looking forward to talking a bit. All right, Ryan. Thanks for coming on, too. We really appreciate it. So uh, I don't know if I, I have Johnny's and I came up with all these questions, mostly Johnny, but uh, I'm going to piggyback off of some of the things he has because I thought there were great things to discuss on the show. But uh, how would you define Doug's offensive scheme the past few years? How how has it changed over the course of the, the couple of seasons from 2016 to now uh, from what you've uh, watched and paid attention to? Yeah, so I, I think when I look at Doug's scheme, you know, honestly, if you go back to day one when, in his press conference when he was asked to describe his scheme, he said it was, you know, a West Coast offense spread hybrid, right? And uh to this day, you look back, I think that's a that's the, probably the best description you can make of, of Doug's offense uh, because, you know, I look at it in two ways. The West Coast offense aspect of it is you could literally go through the last three years of film with Doug's offense and you could cherry pick out plays and concepts and you could put those together in a cut up and it would look almost identical to what Andy ran, you know, in the 90, in the late 90s and the early 2000s, you know, all the traditional, you know, West Coast offense, time drops, passing concepts big influence of the screen game. Uh, you know, it's, it's very influenced by that standard West coast offense. And I think that's something that 
you know, I've been really impressed with how Wentz has evolved in that offense is he's become a very good quarterback in those five and seven step drops, which require, you know, really good timing with the receivers. As soon as that back foot hits, the ball's out. He throws with anticipation. He's not afraid to kind of turn it loose. And, um, you know, you know, obviously we'll get to it later, but you'd like to see some more wide receiver talent to turn that into kind of more yak, which is a big part of the West Coast offense. But, but I think, you know, that's all there. And I think there's also that personal personnel versatility with, you know, 11 and 12 personnel, which we'll talk about a, late, a bit later as well. The spread influence is the thing that I was most intrigued about because, of course, moving from Chip Kelly to Doug Peterson and also seeing how Andy Reid had started to adopt spread, con- uh, spread offense concepts in Kansas City, that was the thing I was most looking forward to seeing seeing what Doug would do there. And and I think I would say the biggest factor or the biggest impact that the spread has had on Doug's offense and many of the NFL offenses is I think the term spread is just, as you guys know, it's, it's a very generic kind of strange term that no one can really truly define what is the spread offense. But I think the biggest component of the spread offense has had the biggest influence on Doug. And as a result, a lot of the NFL teams is the shotgun spread. And the simple idea of, you know, if you look at all the statistics, the amount of shotgun that's running the NFL compared to 10 years ago is, is crazy. I don't have them in front of me. And I think Chip topped this out in his last year in San Francisco was something ridiculous, like 85% of the snaps were at a shotgun. And the reason why, and I have a nice piece that I wrote back in the chip wagon days about, you know, why, why shotgun? Cause a lot of old schoolers saw that and said, they hated the idea of why are we running at a shotgun? It's because they just summed it up and said, this is a, this is a draw play. And so they're just going to run this draw play on third and long and hope to steal some yards and then punt the ball away. But the idea and where that fits into spread is the advantages of shotgun is that the quarterback never takes his eyes off the defense. And so if you think about it, I used to describe it as a bit like play action on steroids because you get the ball, you hit the mesh point, the quarterback makes the decision post snap, whereas play action, you're in the huddle, you call that play. It's either run or pass. You get the ball in your hands, the quarterback turns his back. He, it's already predetermined whether he's handing that ball off or not. And so the defenses can predetermine based on, you know, based on tendencies and things and say, we know this run's coming. The beauty of the shotgun spread is that's where you mix in the RPOs. That's where you mix in the zone reads. That's where you mix in, you know, real play action at a shotgun. But the, the advantage of the quarterback being able to read the defense, see how a certain defender he's reading reacts, and then throw the ball, keep it, or hand it off has really revolutionized the game. And I think that's the component you know, amongst other things that Doug does with spread, and we'll talk about the evolution a bit later, but some of the things I'd like to see even more adopted from the spread, but I'd say that's the biggest factor into, uh, you know, that West Coast offered spread piece. A uh, couple other points I wanted to make. Run game, uh, this is this is very well known, but I love the, the, the multiplicity in the run game. Uh, you know, Chip was very much inside zone, outside zone, sprinkle in the occasional sweep and maybe a little bit of power, 1% of the time, but it was basically inside zone, right? Um, um, with, with you know, in, in Stoutland, there's a lot of credit for this. The multiplicity of the Eagles offense, it's a huge part of what they do, and that shotgun spread fits into it perfectly. But I love watching the Eagles run game. I love the inside zone, the outside zone, the power, the traps, the split zone, the, you know, the, you know there's, there's so much there. And it's, it's that combination of gap schemes, it's zone schemes that makes it really multiple multiple last is the play calling of Doug Peterson. And that gets a lot of credit. You know, he's known as big balls, Doug, everyone loves it. But the more important part about that is, is that Doug's aggressiveness really leads to him taking a whole, it's part of his philosophy. So it's not just that he has big balls and he makes, he's willing to gamble on fourth down. He knows that if he crosses the 50 yard line, most of the time, it's four-down football for him. So that dictates the place he calls. Yeah, that is a pretty impressive answer. I was going to say, if you don't even, you could just turn the podcast off. I mean, don't do that. But you could five minutes there, and you pretty much summed up everything. A few points I want to go over. Um, you mentioned something straight away. Um, I won't question you on all of them. I'll just give my thoughts on some of them as well. Um, when people talk about the shotgun to spread run game as well, sort of this idea, it's a very big philosophy now in the modern game. I think people can sort of overrate or underrate, I should say, how difficult it is for a quarterback to get used to playing with their back to the game. I think it's one of the things we look at when you, I mean, we don't do it as much here, but when you do run this under center sort of play action type stuff where the quarterback turns away from the game, you do have to be quite a specific type of quarterback. I think some quarterbacks just can't do that. I think uh, people forget that you're looking at a picture one second later, you're turning around to hand the ball off. By the time you turn around, that 
defence might look completely different. And obviously, as you said, from the shotgun, you just don't get that issue. Um, it doesn't mean you should always be in shotgun, but it gives you a huge advantage. Uh, it really does help uh, with dicta- with uh, reading coverages when the, when the sort of play is not changing. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned Doug's aggressiveness there as well. I feel like when you're touching on scheme, that's a really important thing because people often think of scheme as like all 22 and you've sort of defined it there as like a philosophical approach, which I always try and do. I talk to Connor all the time about this, about what is the Eagles sort of philosophy? What is their holistic approach to offense? And I don't think you can discuss Doug um, without discussing aggressiveness. And to be honest, I don't think you can discuss Wentz either. I think Wentz and Doug are like one of those rare quarterback head coach combinations where they just fit each other perfectly and um, they're both very very aggressive by nature and I completely agree with you when discussing his offense you can't just it's not just oh we go through it on fourth down it's way more than that it's uh trying tight windows fr- uh, throws on third and 15 rather than checking it down it's as you said running on third and nine because you know you're going to go through it on fourth down there's quite a lot of aggressive uh parts that he does with things and the other thing you mentioned that I was definitely going to bring up anyway was the run game um I've been meaning to write about this for ages, but Doug's uh, run game, I think, is phenomenal. I think a lot of that comes down to Juice and the work of the offensive line coaches that they do. But they can seamlessly run between zone and gap. Uh, you mentioned loads there. I've tried, I've tried to break down. I always run out of time. But I've tried to break down like some of their sweep, trap, split zone. I saw them run duo last year on the goal line as well. Um, one quick question for you, Ryan. Do you think, because at the moment we look at the Eagles backfield, I think we expect them to sign a veteran back, but we've seen Carlos Hyde go. It might be Freeman. I don't want to talk individuals. My question is, do you think the running back can be as diverse as it has been in recent years if you look at just the current crop? Because you may remember if you ever read anything on me on Corey Clement. So, uh, sorry, uh, one second. I really like Corey Clement because he could run everything, and I still think he can. He could run zone gap. You saw him run power and ca- um, power counter. Do you think if it's just Sanders and Scott as the main two, you're going to see a lot more zone? Because they didn't really run any gap with Sanders last year. I did see a bit of duo on the goal line, I think, once or twice. But for the most part, he was quite an inside side, outside zone sweep type. Uh, runner do you think they'll keep up with that type of offense or do you think it might be slightly more generic last year with the, with the current crop of backs they've got aggressive on that and those downs and to try to avoid third and fourth down situations and so i think that aggressiveness and i'm shocked that you know old school nfl coaches ask why hasn't every team caught on to this it's a huge advantage because i think if you look at the eagles offense in 2017 2018 2019 so 17 was terrific 18 and 19, let's be honest, if you look at all the metrics like DVOA, it's been an average to slightly above average offense. But the fact that Doug has this four down aggressive mentality has made it, you know, even though it might only be an above average offense on paper, it makes it that much better. So if we can get back to getting proper playmakers on offense, whence to being healthy, that aggressiveness will make a very good offense, an elite offense, which is what we saw in 2017. So long-winded, but I'd say that sums up where I think we're at right now with Doug's offense and how you define it. Yeah, uh, it's a great question. I think that, uh, number one, I think if you look at Stoutland's history, I think he loves that gap scheme and he's going to try to put it in there as much, you know, as much as he can. I don't think you'll ever see them go away from it. And I think I remember seeing there, certainly you're right. It's a lot of zone with Sanders, a lot of zones with zone with Scott, you know, Clement, I mean, I like him as a player. If, if he can stay healthy, that's great. And I think, you know, there's a spot for him if he can. And, uh, you know, he certainly fits that between the tackles, you know, some of those gap schemes a little bit more. Uh, I do think, and we might touch on this later that one of the influences of, you know, we, there's been a lot of talk this off season about the Shanahan influence and Scangarole coming on board and what's that going to mean. I, I do. I'm curious to see if there is a, uh, a bigger, um, 
involvement for, you know, a lot more usage of outside zone. I mean, you know, Shanahan also has, has gotten a bit branded uh, based on his dad that, you know, it's an outside zone scheme and they run play action off of it. I do think there's elements of that that the Eagles could definitely benefit from. I think Sanders has the potential to be an out of this world outside zone runner. And if you can have Wentz rolling out, uh, you know, on the bootleg, uh, you know, uh, as a compliment to that, I think that's a big thing you'll see more of in this offense. Um, so I think that's something to watch out for, but, you know, in fairness, Shanahan also is very well known, especially in his San Francisco days now of mixing in tons of, uh, gap schemes in addition to his own scheme. So he's not just that. So I think when they look at that, the obvious thing that you look at at that Shanahan influence and that Scangarello influence is, oh, they're going to do more outside zone and they're going to move, move once in the pocket. I think we'll see more of that, but I, I still think you'll see gap schemes in there and we'll see who else they pick up here to see if that gives us a bit of a tip of the hat of, of whether something will happen there. But, but, uh, but yeah, we'll see. All right, Ryan. So let's get into these new coaches. Like you already mentioned, uh, Scandro from Denver. My question about him is, and I mean, I guess you don't worry about it at this point because Carson Wentz is an established quarterback and Doug Peterson and him have all the chemistry in the world. And Press Taylor is also in there in the mix as well. Uh, I did notice last year, I think, I think changing from Flacco to Locke was a huge difference in that aspect, but you still didn't get enough a read of Locke to know if, Scandrell was good in his development. Uh, do you what do you what do you think about him and Carson Wentz in the passing game uh, with him added? I know you mentioned with the Shanahan run concepts. What do you think about from the passing standpoint? Yeah, so uh, you know to answer the first question, the reality is I think they stick with it as long as the personnel th- dictates it, right? Like, you, I'm sure Doug has his preferences. I'm sure if you gave him like carte blanche, you know, starting from scratch roster control and stuff. I, I, I suspect his ideal personnel is, uh, is 11, but he's, you know, with the personnel he's been given, you know, and you look at Ertz and Goddard as two, you know, of you know, the, one of the best tight end duos in the league. And then you look at what we've had at wide receiver, especially when you t- factor in the injuries. I mean, as long as until someone else steps up at the wide receiver position and Jackson stays healthy and hopefully Rager steps up, uh, you're going to see the 12 personnel, whether anybody likes it or not, uh, because, you know, you the best players play. It's, it's, it's the bottom line. And so I think that's that's the first point. I think uh, I think the thing about 12 personnel and I think. I've read some stuff recently that people seem to be a bit more critical of it and expecting a little bit more, especially from, from Goddard, from a productivity standpoint, from 12 personnel. So there's a couple of things I wanted to kind of highlight about that. So one was, is I actually was working on a piece last season and I'd never, ever finished it. And maybe one of these days I'll finish it. But I looked back at uh, all the 2019 touchdowns the Eagles scored in the red zone. And I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I want to say it was crazy. It was like, 80% or so of the touchdowns we scored in the red zone were out of 12 personnel. And um, that's huge. And then I think if you look at the film and watch it and look at all those red zone touchdowns out of 12 personnel, almost every play, the tight end had a major p- impact on the play, whether it was Ertz or Goddard's actually scoring the touchdown or whether it was a key block, mostly from Goddard that, that happened and the design of the run scheme that opened that up. And that really speaks then to your last point about um, – you know, why is 12 personnel a challenge for offenses and, and for defenses? And, and it's because so and that's where it's accentuated in the red zone. Some people will argue Wentz is a great red zone quarterback and Peterson's a great call, play caller. So run 11 personnel, run whatever you want. They're going to be. Yeah, that was very well said, because that's what I was going to. I, I agree with you. I mean, it's it's Doug's team when he's a Super Bowl winning head coach. We, I, I, I'm on the fence where I where I know on Twitter, everybody goes on and says, oh, Doug is a crazy play caller. They need. They, everybody was on the fire growth train like immediately at the start of the season, even last year before uh, this year. So I, I, I do like the new voices and the new concepts you could possibly bring in. I agree with you. I don't. I just don't think you had the personnel to run those sweeps, to run the, get those guys in motion because, as we saw, Nelson Aguilar couldn't win on the outside. We knew his best position was the slot. We knew Jordan Matthews' best position was the slot. So uh, we, we really need uh, – now they have all these speed and this this new personnel that we're going to get into when we talk about wide receivers. I, I hope we do see more of that now this year and open up the offense a lot more, make it more dynamic now that you have all the speed and hopefully it looks reminiscent of 2017. 
that that deception is really critical. So when you look at 12 personnel, uh, you know, there's there's a couple of things that you have to take into account. So looking at, you know, starting with the run game for 12 personnel, um, you know, it really I mentioned it really dictates the the personnel, the defense plays and the coverage that they play, et cetera. At the very foundation of 12 personnel, you know, if we break it right down to the X's and O's, if you think about 11 personnel, and it's a shame we don't have a chalkboard to draw on here, but basically if you think about 11 personnel with a slot receiver, one tight end, if you think about how that looks on the chalkboard, there's seven gaps that the defense has to fill when you line that up. So if you have a five-man line and then you have a tight end at the end of the line, that's seven gaps that the defense has to account a defender for in the run game. The moment you bring in that extra tight end, and even if you put them on the line or you line them up almost like an H back, all of a sudden they now have eight gaps to defend. So as a result of that, someone needs to account for that eighth gap. And the defense has 11 players. So if you do the math and you have to account for that eighth gap, it's most often the free safety, which means you're going to get, by virtue of that, a lot of single high looks. So then you're looking at cover one, you're looking at cover three, where you have one deep safety. And so what that then does is it puts the defense in a bind because number one, um, you know, now from a passing perspective, you have the opportunity to attack downfield because there's only one deep safety. The reason why I think the Eagles haven't been as successful passing out of 12 personnel is because we don't have those threats on the outside, especially last year. Who are you going to pay attention to in 12 personnel? You're going to clog up the middle of the field as much as possible where Ertz and Goddard are. I do think the Eagles could do a better job of especially using Goddard as more of a vertical threat downfield, down the middle uh, in the absence. But I do think in the 12 personnel perspective, I think having two wide receivers with speed with Jackson and Rager could really open up things and make 12 personnel more important. Uh, the last thing, which I think is very well known about 12 personnel, is defenses will decide, okay, it, historically, if an offense rolled out 12 personnel, the defense is going to roll out their base defense. You're going to have that extra linebacker out because they're defending against the run. They want to manage those eight gaps that are that are there to be accounted for. Um, and when you have two great pass threat options like Goddard and Ertz, that means you should get a linebacker or at worst case, a safety on those linebackers. So I think that is a, that's a critical piece as well that the Eagles manipulate. Well, I think the unfortunate thing for the Eagles in some way is because of their lack of, um, you know, strength at the wide receiver position. You know, I think if you look at how teams defend 12 personnel from the Eagles, the last couple of years, they just straight roll out their nickel. They roll out their nickel, and that's why the stats show we run well because we're going to run against a nickel a nickel personnel when we have 12 personnel. But when we're passing, you know, Goddard and Ertz are drawing corners or safeties, which is less advantageous than running against their base. So, again, I think that the impact of that wide receiver position will have a huge impact on on how we perform. Yeah, how I we agree. It's a, some good insight there. Yeah, it's going to be a weird one with the running back situation. I sort of, uh, they always have that sort of power back, haven't they? They've had that in recent years, whether that's the Garen Blunt or someone like that that can run that more gap scheme. I think, like you said, Sanders will run uh, more of his own stuff still. Um, we will get into the new coaches. I want to ask one thing before that, because I think it's quite a hot topic at the moment. Uh, we mentioned about one-two personnel uh, off-air. Um, it's a really interesting point because I think you've got some people and I think I've often wondered this, whether Doug actually doesn't want to be a one, two personnel offense. He would much rather be uh, a one, one personnel with three wide receivers. And basically he's had to do it because of there's just a severe deficiency in talent at wide receiver. I think you look at like the golden Tate trade, you could say that was meant to give him that slot receiver. So two quick questions. What do you think? Firstly, do you think that we're going to continue to run one, two personnel as much as maybe recent years. And secondly, just a little bit of a schematic breakdown. What would you say from watching the Eagles in recent years are the biggest sort of positives that one, two personnel brings to Eagles? And then what would you say are sort of the major negatives that could see them move slightly away from it? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I'll say this about the new coaches. I mean, uh, I think you got to look at it kind of a little bit honestly. And I mean, they brought in a, new, a lot of new people and I think, you know, everybody was looking for that. I think everyone said, you know, this, this team, this offense is great as Doug is. They need some, some new ideas. They need some new voices. You need, to, you need to get some influence coming in. And so I think you're going to see, you know, in 2020, uh, hopefully we'll see that uh, you're going to see sprinkles of influence, I think, but let's be honest, you're not going to see something dramatically different. Cause I think unless you're talking about a, you know, on the offensive and defensive side of the ball, if you're not actually talking about like a Vic Fangio or a Wade Phillips or a Mike Martz or a Gary Kubiak, I think these things, when you make changes to the coaching staff, can be really overrated in the sense of, you know, 
how much is the offense going to be like going to evolve or revolutionize? And at the end of the day, you know, I think we all agree, you know, Doug's the man, he won the Super Bowl. I know you can't hang your head on that forever, but you know, things aren't necessarily going to change schematically dramatically. When you look at, you know, it's still going to be Doug's offense. He's still calling the plays. He has this, you know, certainly this, handshake agreement with Schwartz and with Stoutland and others that look, I'm going to call the plays. I'm going to handle the offense. I'm going to do this. I'm going to handle the passing game. That's not to say Press Taylor or Scangarello aren't going to have an influence, but I do think it's not going to be like this dramatic thing. I think what you will see is, you know, I mentioned, you know, again, if we're going to depend on Scangarello bringing in some of the Shanahan influences, actually, I think, so I talked about the outside zone, the pocket movement, all those things will be great for, for Wentz, I think. And so I think we'll see some more of that, but it's not like we hadn't seen that before. And it's not like we don't know how to run outside zone or we don't know how to run a play action, you know, bootleg. Uh, you'll probably see more of that. The thing that I really love about the Shanahan offense, and I don't even know that Wentz needs a ton of this, but you look at what Garoppolo does in that, and and it's just creating very well-defined reads and making the quarterback job easier than it than it needs like than it needs to be. I mean, I think that you know, in, in some ways, when you watch the Eagle offense the last couple of years with Carson, you feel bad because of the personnel, but you you also just get the feeling we we need him to do too much. We need to do him too much. So I think there's like 20 percent of the offense that you could probably tweak to make things a bit easier for him to have some more defined reads. So put him in a position where he's rolling out on play action. But the other thing that I think could have a big impact, and whether this comes from Press or Scangarello, is one thing that. I've really missed in the Eagles offense, even going back to the Chip Kelly days, it drove me nuts. He didn't use it more. Uh, I'm a little bit disappointed. We haven't seen it more with Peterson. When we talk about the spread hybrid is a lot more motion and a lot more ghost motion, jet motion, uh, orbit motion, things like that. We saw some of it chips first year and there was just so many dynamic things that it creates, especially when you're running that shotgun spread, right? If you're doing that jet sweep, I mean, the way you look at the shotgun spread and you, the way you look at the zone read, there's so many things you can build off of that from a spread concept. Everybody knows the classic zone read where the quarterback's in the shotgun at the mesh point, you leave the, uh, the, the defensive end unblocked. The quarterback reads them. If the, if the defensive end stays with the quarterback, he hands it off. If he goes after the running back, the quarterback keeps. Now, we're not going to be using that for Wentz a ton. We know that. We've seen that. You know, we've got to give up on seeing that more. However, the thing that used to drive me nuts, especially during the Sam Bradford era with, with Chip Kelly, was he knew he had a quarterback. We still ran shotgun a ton. We still ran that mesh point, lots of inside, outside zone. But we knew we were never going to run Sam Bradford on, the, on those zone reads. So we continued to run shotgun spread. And so if you're going to do that, then use these other constraints. Use the jet sweep because you can accomplish the same thing with a jet sweep where you leave that edge defender unblocked because he has to honor that jet sweep to create you know, opportunities in the run game or in the pass game. Uh, I love the orbit motion we used to do where basically you've got the, the wide receiver motioning into the backfield. And then again, at the mesh point, the quarterback can either hand off the quarterback can run or they can pitch it out to the, the wide receiver going on the reverse in the orbit motion. I think, you know, that's something that, you know, when you watch Shanahan's offense and now, of course, the morning wake piece and, and working with the Ravens and, and Lamar Jackson, seeing what they do on offense. And then you see what the, the Chiefs do with motion. I think that's the thing. And as we segue into discussing wide receivers, I think that's the more underrated aspect of the wide receivers and the ones we brought in and the emphasis on speed. Everyone knows the speed emphasis we want to have more threats downfield. I actually think the bigger impact we might see with the speed is how it impacts the offense horizontally. So will we will we see more of these jet motions, these orbit motions that will again be used to create more defined reads and more open windows for Wentz as opposed to the classic West Coast offense drop back, wide receivers getting open, delivering the football. So I think again we won't see a huge massive change in our offense, but I do think that's where you'll see some sprinkles of influence from press and, and Scangarello and morning Way. Yeah. Just really quickly as well, Connor, you sort of style um, point I was going to make. I think you made a really good point, Ryan, about, I don't think teams sort of, they don't do motion for the sake of motion. Like you said, uh, they don't just do these things uh, for sort of the sake of it. I think there has to be an end game. So I think when you look at the shotgun spread in particular, when you look at this idea of sort of the RPOs, um, you want this idea 
of where you can run sort of bubble screens. You can potentially give that wide receiver the ball on the jet sweep because if you never give him the ball as he's running motion, if you if you fake a jet sweep a hundred times, never actually give him the ball to run, um, it's essentially defenses are going to start not respecting it. I think the biggest problem the Eagles had is that I'm not really sure they wanted the ball. They didn't really have any playmakers, which I always think players, as you said earlier on, players determine scheme to an extent. A coach can do what he wants, but he needs to have players that fits that. Um, a big issue last year, a major, major issue, which is why we're not going to have this debate now, but personally, me and Connor, I think Connor was the same as me on this, didn't want Justin Jefferson here, was nothing to do with him as a player in terms of was he good or bad. But the Eagles, everyone spoke about speed last year. Speed was a huge, huge issue. But the lack of yards after catch was a massive issue it was arguably as big of an issue as speed they didn't have people that could beat uh like catch the ball beat a man and just sometimes get 10 20 yards from a four or five yard play do you see some teams just run these bubble screens and sometimes Tyreek Hill's got a guy two yards away from him he's not open but he'll beat the guy and sprint 15 20 yards down the field um that's not scheme getting him open that's scheme just getting him the ball and him doing the rest and Eagles just did not have those weapons last year so I think it's a good combination I think some people will get sort of too excited about new coaches like you said and expect a whole uh, new offense that's not going to happen it's going to be a similar offense to what we've seen in the past what I think like you've said they'll do really well and I'm going to steal a quote um from I think your last piece from the athletic that stands with me where I think you said something like horizontal is a new vertical I think in the NFL currently that's the way a lot of teams are looking at it you look at what the 49ers have done adding Ayuk to Debo Samuel they are players that are explosive with the ball in their hands and the Eagles have did not have that player and I think that's why uh, Rager was so appealing to them because I hope like you I think uh, the lack of motion was a shame last year I think like you said everything you said it defines reads it makes it easier for quarterbacks I think Eagles would have struggled to do that last year because of a lack of personnel but I do think they could have done it more so I am interested to see if they start bringing that in more I will just raise one point um not to debate really just something I read uh, earlier this week which was just sort of stood out because it came up in the conversation I was reading something about Peyton Manning and I don't know why I don't know if you knew this or I didn't I must confess um they said that Peyton Manning hated motion he sort of refused to run motion uh, even when he was with the Broncos because he hated the fact that the defense changed uh, sort of pre-snap, which is interesting because a lot of quarterbacks want the full picture. In Manning's point of view, he was so confident that he knew what he was going to do and what the defence was showing. And I've often argued this on Twitter as well, that I think one of the Eagles' downfalls in recent years, and this is coming from someone who thinks Wentz is a top eight, six, top eight, top six quarterback in the league. I think Wentz is probably better than the national media give him credit for. And I think that's, and I felt that since he came out, I was incredibly high on him pre-draft. But I think the Eagles, which is ironic because they just took a quarterback in the second round, which I get, but I think the Eagles absolutely love Wentz. I think Doug thinks the absolute limit of Wentz. I don't think, if you were to put Harry and Doug in a room and say you could trade Wentz to any other quarterback, I think maybe you put Patrick Mahomes uh, I think maybe they'd take Russell Wilson and Lamar Jackson possibly and I'm not even convinced by that I think they think he is exceptional and I think what that sometimes does is a bit like Peyton Manning with a motion issue I think they put too much on his plate I think they expect him to save them not in a way that they're making it impossible for him to succeed because I think they're still putting him in good spots but I think maybe one thing the Eagles will do this year is with uh, Scangarello coming on um, and you seem to agree with this they might almost scale it back a little bit and try and make it a bit easier for the quarterback because I think in recent years um, they have made it really really difficult for him to succeed not because they're bad play callers not because uh, um, their scheme is bad or anything but I just think they've put a serious amount on his plate and I think actually it's a compliment to Wentz I think it's because they think the world of him so yeah like you I'm really interested to see if they uh, scale it down yeah, I mean, I think I think it's a great point. I think it relates to the point you made earlier about um, about you know the, when we're talking about the shotgun spread and and you know guys need to be able to drop back and and see the defense right away and the adjustment it is and that's that's what you know back in the day when people used to always debate about a quarterback if they could make it in the NFL a draft pick saying well is he pro style is he pro ready and what that meant was could he play under center you know could he you know turn his back to the defense could he you know adjust the timing of the game and the reality is is you know, a lot of a lot of NFL coaches now have no choice but to adopt the shotgun spread because that's the quarterbacks that are coming out. This is the way they've been taught. They rely on that. They need it. A guy like Peyton Manning, you know, I don't have to tell you that, you know, he's a once in a generation kind of player, obviously. And, and, and yeah. You know, so I mean, like, yeah, sure, he can have that preference and I could see exactly where he's coming from. But the problem is, is in today's NFL, with a lot of these quarterbacks that come from the spread coming into college, the NFL, they don't have that intellectual, you know, knowledge and capacity to be able to do that. Uh, and, and, you know, that, that, 
you know, whatever it, whatever it is that, that Manning has that's, that allows them to do that. So they need the offense to help them. They need the scheme to help them. So they need these, you know, motions. And, and a lot of wide receivers need these motions as well so they can get off press coverage and different things like that. So, so I, I, think, it's a, I think it's an excellent point, and it's a really interesting observation. I, n- I never read that, so I'm glad, I'm glad to hear you say that. But, uh, but, yeah, I think that's just a natural evolution of the game and is that, you know, it just goes to show how much this game has changed. Yeah, and I think as we move on to wide receivers as well, something to ask about you there. I think it's similar to wide receivers. You mentioned about motion, getting them off press coverage. Um, I'm not sure the Eagles have helped their wide receivers a lot in recent years without using motion, um, to be honest. But I think the Eagles have sort of obviously suffered with a lack of talent. But like you said, coming out of college, a lot of them just don't face consistent press coverage anyway. So it's really hard to project receivers to be an ex-receiver or to mm-hmm. expect them to go up against really good press corners in the NFL and win because they just don't do it much in college. So I think if you can use motion, um, I I think I, I wrote about this uh, for, uh, a couple of months ago. I don't know if you saw, I wrote for BGN about why people miss on wide receivers so much. And there's a quote from Carl Shanahan basically saying that Debo Samuel's route running was rubbish coming out of college. And there's a guy they took in the second round and a guy with a great rookie season. And that's the head coach openly saying to reporters, he doesn't run very good routes. And it wasn't like a big deal. It was sort of like a throwaway comment. And then they drafted Ayuk this year. And whether you believe them or not, they say uh, he was up there as a top wide receiver on their board. Um, and again, that's I think it's because when you use motion, certain receivers can win. It's where it all comes back to scheme, I guess. But I think the beauty of football, and from a philosophical point, is that I think players determine scheme, but also scheme helps players so much. Um, so on that note, Ryan, what do you think? Uh, last question on the offense, I think, and then we'll... Uh, switch to the other side of the ball um, Eagles wide receivers last year were clearly not very good I think I've made it pretty clear on this podcast I don't have a lot of hope for JJ Asego outside not because I dislike him but I wasn't a huge fan of him coming out and I think he lacks uh, explosive traits that you want to win on the outside in the NFL um, I am very optimistic about Ray but obviously as a rookie uh, then we've obviously got uh, Dishon Jackson coming back but what do you think of the current group sort of on paper do you think they're going to enable the Eagles uh, to open up the scheme a little bit do you think they're going to be able to run the type of offence um, and I guess really, do you think they're going to be good enough for Wentz to sort of get back to where he's been previously when we've seen what he can do with competent wide receivers? Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'll be honest. I mean, I, you know, this is the, this is the debated position that everybody in, in Eagles podcasts and, and media have been talking about for months. So I will say that you're not going to hear any, you know, novel creative thoughts from me on this one. But, uh, you know, I pretty much I think in the same boat as everyone that, you know, we need more talent and I think they've done an okay job, but I think you could, you could even add, add some more talent. Um, so a couple things as it ties with the last topic that we mentioned. So on the, you know, using the wide receivers horizontally versus vertically and the, and the importance of speed there. The one other thing I wanted to touch on that. And, and one of the reasons why I like the Rager pick quite a bit is you talk about that horizontal stretch and you talk about the need for speed for things like jet sweeps, especially in orbit motion and things like that. Well, it takes a certain type of receiver to be able to pull those off. And it's, and it's not just speed. So you can look at like, Deshaun Jackson's the fastest guy on our roster. He will be until he retires. I mean, he just is. No one's going to beat him in a foot race. You know, I don't care what anybody else says. He's the fastest guy, but he's not the type of player that you're going to want to be giving the ball to on jet sweeps just because I mean, he's got the speed to get to the edge, but, you know, I have an old a old friend of mine that used to always talk to, talk to me about the difference between a kick returner and a punt returner. And you have a punt returner whose job is to make the first guy miss and then turn on the afterburners. And, you know, that's Deshaun, you know, in a nutshell, as a punt returner. He makes that first guy miss. And if you miss him, he's going, he's going the distance. A kick returner, I, I remember back in the days of Jeremy Macklin and seeing him in college that he was like a, a decent kick returner. And we thought that, okay, in his rookie year, he'd make an impact as a kick returner. I remember watching him in preseason, and I don't know that we ever saw many more reps from Macklin as a kick returner outside of that, that first preseason. It was awful. I mean, because he had the speed and the athleticism to be a good kick returner and got away with it in college. But you need a certain mentality as a kick returner where when you get the ball, I think you always have to be a little bit crazy. And I think that's where Rager fits in here a little bit is that there's no hesitation when you get the ball as a kick returner. You don't make that. If you stop to try to make that first guy miss, there's four other guys that are going to tackle you. It's basically almost like a running back hitting the hole. You catch the ball and you immediately burst up the field and you expect your blocks to be there and you try to find the seam and then you're off. It's the same type of quality you need as a wide receiver to be successful running those jet sweeps. Like you look at a guy like Tyreek Hill, who they run a lot of those motions and those, those sweeps with, I mean, yeah, he's fast like Jackson and yes, he's small, but he has a bit more of that mentality of, 
you know, he's very decisive and he, he's got no fear, even though he's small. And so that's where I think there's a difference between a Jalen Rager and Deshaun Jackson. And so I think, you know, Rager is going to be able to potentially help you do some of those things, um, you know, that they, they've tried to have Aguilar do, um, uh, over the years because they didn't have anyone else to do it. So wanted to make a point on that. Outside of that, on wide receiver, uh, you know, I did see your piece on JJ J, J, J. Ortega Whiteside. Um, uh, th- really, there's nothing more to, to really discuss on that. I agree with you. I think you really can't expect a hell of a lot. Anything you get, really, it's a shame. He's a second round pick. It's a shame that, you know, you have to look at that at him as a bonus at this point. Um, but I guess in theory, where you see JJ Ortega Whiteside, I mean, he's got an opportunity here because if you look at the Eagles wide receiver makeup right now and you look at the roster, the one thing they don't really have is your prototypical X receiver, right? You know, and maybe Rager comes that. I'd be surprised if they put him there at the, from the start. I think you're going to see more of him in the slot in the early stages. Um, but, uh, you know, so. If presuming they keep Alshon, and we can leave that for another day, but presuming they keep Alshon, he's likely not going to be available until halfway through the season. So Ortega Whiteside's got a couple months in the season to have an opportunity to make some plays out of that exposition. Because out of all the wide receivers we have, he's really the only guy that that kind of fits that prototype in our offense as an ex, ex receiver. Uh, so you know, and you know, so he'll have an opportunity. I, I'm not optimistic, but we'll see what happens. But I think what you'll ultimately see happen is that the one thing the Eagles do have as a bit of a luxury is the best ex-ISO receiver the Eagles have on the roster is Zach Ertz. And that's how they use him. So they run a ton of three-by-one formations where Ertz is the ex-receiver. You get the added benefit that he's often lined up against safety. So if you have a bunch of stuff going on and you have something like Deshaun at the Z running down the field on the three wide receiver side, then you've got more space to work with for the ex-receiver, which is where the benefits of an ex-receiver come from. Ertz gets that as a safety matchup. I mean, the classic example is the winning Super Bowl touchdown, right? He gets he gets isolated as the X receiver. Uh, when they motion people out of the way, he gets lined up against a damn good safety for the Patriots, and he left him in the dust. It makes the winning Super Bowl touchdown catch. So I think that's what will ultimately happen. Unless JJ, JJ can step up, you know, they'll rely more and more on Ertz and maybe even Goddard in that X iso role. Uh, and then hopefully either Rager can step up there or, you know, maybe Alshon comes back and, and you rely on him for the second half of the season. But, but I'd say those are the two comments I'd make about the wide receiver position that aren't, you know, rehashes of what we've all been talking about this off season. Yeah, I think we've all spoke about wide receivers uh, quite a lot. Yeah, some really interesting points there. I think I said the same thing in my piece, actually, that JJ uh, um, AW has got a chance because he does fit, like you said, um, a different type of player than the Eagles have got. He's the only one, exactly like you said, he fits that um, sort of prototype of an ex-receiver. And I also think, this is a completely off-topic point, but sometimes I quite often see, like, JJ, I think, oh, it's like, and people will often say to me, um, yeah, but we don't have an ex-receiver anymore. Eagles have, and, and I, I get it, Eagles are very multiple. Eagles do a lot of different things. And like you said, Zach Ertz is probably their best ex-ISO. Oh, well, he is. Um, and I think Zach Ertz's route running is still so, so underrated into how good he can be out there. But a lot of the time, Eagles will be in one two or or, um, when they're in 1-1 personnel, they will have an X receiver. They're not like a brand new offense. that It's not physically possible. The rules of the game means you have to have players lined up on the line of scrimmage. So someone's going to get pressed. And the end of the day, it's going to most likely be him because you're not going to want Deshaun Jackson staring right at a huge cornerback where he can um, touch proper line of scrimmage. And I completely agree with you. I don't think Rager year one anyway, because of like we've already said, coming out um, of college, they don't do a lot of that. He's he would struggle with more physical cornerbacks, I think, almost certainly. At the end of the day, Rager is their first round pick, but they need to have work this year. So I think just because he's not the ex receiver doesn't mean he's not going to get uh, the best looks. He might end up being the target more often than not. Um, but like you said, I think there is sort of a chance for JJ. I think it was like, just because he does fit that role. But I sort of completely agree with you in the same sense um, that he sort of probably won't be much, and you try and get anything you can out of him. But he does still have a role. Um, to play on this offense right I think we will move uh, we spent quite a lot of time on the offense which I'm re- I must admit most of the stuff I've read with you in the past years has been offense based so I haven't uh, seen you do as much stuff on defense so I'm quite interested to hear your thoughts so really quickly uh, we'll start from a basic just like we've done with offense uh, seeing as I think it's quite good to touch down on what the actual scheme is so Jim Schwartz from my perspective and this is a very very simple summary I'll let you expand um, 
for me, the way I see Jim Schwartz's scheme, and this is about as simple as I can make uh, make it, is ideally he wants an extremely good front four, dominant front four. They are they have to carry the team. That has to be your resource. They have to go on the front four. He does quite a good job of mixing coverage up, um, coverages up on the back end. So his cornerbacks and stuff, they'll play a, a mix of different coverages. I and mean, on top of that, he'll, he'll often uh, use a variety of different bl- blitzes. And I think in recent years, we've seen him mix up the pre-snap looks. And I think often that's not necessarily to blitz, um, but often it's to try and get matchup on defensive line one-on-one. So you'll see him push a linebacker um, into the A-gap or something to try and get Brandon Graham or Fletcher Cox one-on-one. He also does a very good job sort of moving around the defensive line so they're not um, repeatedly in the same position. And we've even seen, I think, I'm not sure as much we saw last year, but we have seen in the past even uh, some really sort of all-out cover zero blitzes where he's sort of uh, thrown the house. But I think for the most part, if someone asked me to describe what Jim Schultz wants, he wants to win with four because that gives him a lot more flexibility. It's a simple mass game. It allows him to mix up coverage on the back end. Uh, what do you think, uh, based on what I've said? How would you sort of describe Schultz overall? Uh, similar or would you slightly, uh, and obviously expand on what I've said, of course? Yeah, yeah. No, I think I think you've done a good job of the overview there. And I think, uh, I mean, I think you're, you're pretty much spot on to describe what he wants to do. And I, I think in general, I think it, every coach wants to win with four. If you can win with four and cover with seven, every coach will take it, right? Um, regardless of what scheme they're playing. But, uh, you know, obviously Eagles take that to a bit of an extreme. They they really emphasize that front four. They invest a lot in that front four. Um, so that's a big part of what Schwartz has always been about. I think the thing about Schwartz's scheme is, is it does, is it does, it's cliche, but it starts up front. But I think the one thing I'll say about this is, I say one of my biggest pet peeves that I hear when people talk about it on TV announcers, like people that are, you know, really should be pretty well informed is I hate hearing Jim Schwartz's wide nine scheme. I hate, or I hate, you know, they had, they hear, they come in today with the wide nine scheme, you know, and I've, I know a lot of people have been on this soapbox. So I'll just add myself to it. Like the wide nine is not a scheme. Okay. So that's first and foremost. And like the, the, the nine is referring to a technique or the alignment of the defensive end. So it's not even the way the whole defensive line lines up. It's referring to the defensive end in the nine technique. And I think most people know this by now, but still it's like, maybe it's semantics, but the idea that it's a wide nine scheme is, is factually incorrect. So, so starting with that, and I think the best illustration I can give without, again, the use of visuals and such is where, where Schwartz is super creative. In some ways, I find he, he operates a lot like a 3-4 defensive coordinator in that he moves his his players around quite a bit along the defensive line. And, you know, I think he's really good at, at mixing up different techniques and different alignments along the line to put the front four in the best position to be successful. And so uh, one illustrative example is, and I think if you take it forward into 2020, something I think you'll see a fair amount of in pass rush situations is I love the acquisition of Javon Hargrave. Um, I think what you'll see sometimes, and we've seen this in the past with other players, is imagine Javon Hargrave lined up in the zero technique, which is right over the center, okay? So you've got Hargrave. I know he's not a nose tackle. I know he wasn't used as a nose tackle in Pittsburgh. But but imagine him in our pass rushing scheme lined up over the center. Then you've got Fletcher Cox lined up in a three technique, which is outside – uh, outside on the outside shoulder of the guard. Okay. So if you can visualize that and then the beauty of the nine technique is then you take your defensive end, whether that's Graham or Barnett or whomever you put them at the nine technique, which is outside of the outside shoulder of the tight end. Imagining if a tight end's there, the tight end's not always there, but that's the wide part of the wide nine. So if you think about that alignment and think about the matchups that create is what it means is that that center has no choice, but to take on Hargrave because he's right in his face that guard has to take on Fletcher Cox. And because of the wide nine alignment of that defensive end, that tackle has to take the defensive defensive end. So if you've got Hargrave occupying the center, who then can't double team Cox, and you have that right tackle having to shuffle his feet all the way on the outside to cut off that wide nine rusher, you got Fletcher Cox one on one against a offensive guard, and there aren't many offensive guards that, is go- that are going to stop him from doing that. So that's just one example of how Schwartz moves guys around to create pass rush opportunities. You could see examples where Hargrave will line up in a one technique and Fletcher Cox in a two technique, and then you'll have the defensive end in the five technique. He's always thinking about on pass rush situations, you know, less about blitzing but more about those techniques, and then. 
what you mentioned, Johnny, is is that idea that he will show blitz looks. So we'll see some double A gap um, threats. And all of that he has in mind is like he's trying to fool the offensive line into saying, okay, I can't go over and double this pass rusher because this guy might be coming. So he does that through creative alignments of the defensive line and techniques, but also by threatening to blitz. At the end of the day, Schwartz has been in this in this uh, in the league for a long time. I think the idea of whether he's going to blitz more or less next season is always going to be a variable. I don't think you're going to see Schwartz coming in to a season at the start of the season saying, "I'm going to blitz more." I think he's always going to roll with it. We've seen seasons in Buffalo where Schwartz blitzed a ton. We've seen seasons in Philly where he's hardly blitzed at all. And I think, yeah, you're right. His general philosophy is, "I want to win with four as long as he can do that." you know, he'll continue to do that. Uh, I do think that the one thing that has me wondering a little bit is, I mean, there's been a lot of changes in the secondary. Um, I do wonder, maybe there's a slight shift happening here. I'm surprised they haven't done more on the defensive end position, um, either through free agency or the draft. Uh, obviously, Hargrave was a great addition. They've made some emphasis with Malik Jackson and that Fletcher Cox on the interior de- de- defensive line. I still think there's got to be a move to be made there. I don't know what it is. I don't know how much they can put into it. But if they don't, and, you know, it's just a minor thing like a Vinnie Curry, someone I've never been a huge fan of, uh, maybe it suggests maybe there's something slightly different coming because the defensive line isn't quite as strong on the edge as it has been uh, in the past as far as in terms of investment. Yeah, that – yeah, sorry, that's that's really interesting because I I was going to ask you about that. I didn't have it down as a question to ask you. And as you're talking, I'm thinking – what about Derek Barnett? And I think you sort of answered your uh, my own question there about your opinion of Derek Barnett. You're obviously not um, – you don't think he's panned out as much as a first-round pick has. Is that fair to say? Um, yeah, I'm mixed on it. I think the biggest issue with Barnett is just durability. I mean, if, if the guy can stay healthy and play, it, it's really hard to say. I think this is a big year for him because uh, I think he's, there's promise. I think there's some things he does well. I think there's some things that he has to work on. I don't think he's ever going to be an elite pass rusher. I don't think he has the combination of skills and – and abilities to to really make him a truly elite pass rusher, but can he be an eight to ten sack guy for the next for the next you know four or five years? Yeah, I think he probably can be if he can stay healthy and play sixteen games and continue to evolve his game. I think coming off no injuries, it'll be interesting to see if he can really take that step. This is a huge year for him. I think if he doesn't, if he continues to produce what he's been producing, I think it then makes you kind of start to worry. Um, but I think the Eagles are just invested in beyond those starting two defensive ends. And if you look at Brandon Graham, I love Brandon Graham. Uh, I hope he plays forever, but the reality is, is, you know, we're one injury from him away from, you know, being in a pretty bad situation. And in, in the past, they've made some, a little bit of overkill acquisition in some ways as that third or fourth defensive acquisition, defensive end acquisition. And now you've got Barnett, you've got Graham, and then you've got Sweat. And I don't feel great about that. So I, I do think something's got to come there, but I also feel like it's maybe a little bit too late in the game. I don't see any, any all pro pass rusher walking in the door, um, you know, over the next couple of weeks to months, uh, they'll probably do something there to bring in a veteran or something. But um, yeah, I think Barnett's uh let's give him one more year and see, but, uh, but still, I think there's not enough investment on that defensive end position at the moment. Yeah, no, it's really interesting. Me and Corey have spoke a lot off air, actually. We haven't done a podcast, I don't think, where we touched on the defensive end position too much. We spoke a lot off air about, I just I just assume they bring back Vinnie Curry. I just don't see how they don't. So I can't, I'm, I know, you like you said, maybe there's someone else, but I completely agree with you. There has to be one more addition. Um, I'm going to write about Josh Sweat, uh, so I won't say too much now, just because uh, I don't want to repeat myself. But I'm re- I, I think upside-wise, Josh Sweat sort of skies the limit. I think he's got incredible ability, but I think he's still a way away from really being someone and you view that if uh, Brandon Graham or Derek Barnett goes down, you think, brilliant, Josh Wett, just plug and play, um, he'll start. I, I think he's still a little bit far away from that. I think he's got issues in the run game he needs to work on a little bit as well. Um, so I think we'll see. Yeah, but he's not Michael Bennett. He's not Chris Long. You know, he's not these guys that we've relied on the last few years. And, you know, he might become that, but I think you're you're betting a lot to expect him to become that. And it just hasn't been the Eagles' style at the defensive end position to rely on – you know, fourth, fifth round rookies to kind of immediately step up. I mean, he definitely showed some positive signs and I'll leave that for you to outline um, in the future here. Mm-hmm. Look forward to it. But, um, but yeah, I think, uh, yeah, he's, he's a nice player, but um, he's not that third DE that we've been used to seeing just yet. Yeah. No, I'd be, uh, be wrong, but we'll see. 
Yeah, no, I, compl- I I totally agree. I think I'm I'm surprised like you they haven't made a move. And one thing I wanted to mention actually, um, as well is I think I probably <laughs> stupidly said when I explained the the scheme that I said Schwartz wants to win with four because you're right, every single coach wants to win with four. That's an obvious statement. However, I think I think you commented on this. I think the Eagles put so much resource into their front four. I think they clearly expect that front four to basically dominate. I think the, the Eagles' defense, in yeah. my opinion, goes as far as the front four goes. And one thing about this, when you talk about the lack of defensive end, people will say. Well, why is it so important? Um, I think part of the Eagles' philosophy, and I spoke about this actually with Connor on my last podcast, um, and I said that I hate it when people say the Eagles like don't care about linebacker. Well, of course they care about linebacker. They don't go into the season saying, let's have bad linebackers. That would be a great idea. They obviously care about the position. However, I think their ideal situation is that their front four is going to be so good, they can essentially take pressure off the linebackers because you don't. it's just easier for them. You don't have to maybe charge the hole as quickly as possible. You can be a bit more patient behind the line of scrimmage because you think your lineman might win. Your linemen are probably going to take that all coverage they'll win more in the I mean Brandon Graham I'm sure has killed so many outside zone plays from the backside um the last two years that he saved the linebackers a lot of tackles um but my question for you is I guess is and apologies I didn't put this as one of the ones I was going to ask you so I'm throwing you on the spot uh do you think that the linebackers this year could uh, if the defensive line isn't, say, outstanding, and I think at times we've seen the defensive line be outstanding and the Eagles' run D maybe as recent years has been brilliant, do you think the linebackers could be a problem this year? Because I think the linebackers are, yeah. like you said, like the backup defensive end, that is a worry. If the, if the, if the defensive line doesn't dominate, um, you might see the linebackers, and it's not a hot take to say they're not that good, but do you, do you see that being an issue uh, this year, essentially? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, uh, we, we talk all off season about the question marks of wide receiver and corner and, you know, different positions, pick your pick your poison. Linebacker flies under the radar, largely because they haven't invested heavily in it over the years, so people have stopped expecting it. Um, yeah, I think it could be a pretty big problem in, in a lot of ways. I mean, again, I think that Schwartz invests and in, in, in spends so much time on that run D for right or for wrong that um, I'd be surprised if, all of a sudden, magically, the Eagles defense becomes a liability against the run. Um, I do think, again, that's an area where I think you're probably going to see a veteran acquisition come June, come July, August, whenever whenever the time comes. Uh, I think, you know, there's there's a lot of hope uh, in the linebacker position right now. I think Nick Gary's an okay player. He's shown some flashes, I guess, but he's not someone that, you know, locked in. Like, we don't have our Nigel Bradham, the guy that, you know, we knew – was going to be a solid player for us. You don't, you don't have any one of those guys at the linebacker position. Uh, and of course the Eagles do play a lot of nickel and dime. And so, you know, a little bit less emphasis there and you'll see more of that too, especially when you look at the personnel moves that they've made. But yeah, I think it certainly could be, could be an issue. Um, and uh, you know, the other thing I'll say about the defensive line uh, aside from, from that as well is that, uh, you know, I was, I think I was listening to Fran Duffy's podcast. And I think it, I think it was Kurt Warner he had on, and Kurt Warner was talking about how the quarterback, what they really hate is pressure up the middle. They're like, you know, the defensive ends, like, yeah, nobody likes getting sacked by Reggie White or Lawrence Taylor uh, off the edge, but and you know they get a lot of the attention. But he said, you know, if you ask any quarterback, what they hate is pressure up the middle, especially if they're not a mobile quarterback. And so it could be too that, you know, with the, uh, you know, the Malik Jackson, they put a lot of resource on him last year and it's a shame he got hurt. Uh, and then to double down and now go get Hargrave, you know, I'm still, I'm still curious as to whether they will, those three got like, whether Jackson will truly be on the roster come September or whenever we start football, like there's an outside chance, but if it's not, and he's a lock, then maybe there's also a bit of a shift in philosophy of Schwartz saying, you know what, the inside the pressure, you know, we're going to double down on inside pressure because that's the assets we had available that we liked the most and hope that helps out the edge players a little bit more too. So, uh, but yeah, but otherwise back to the linebackers, I think, you know, there's this, again, kind of like the wide nine, there's a bit of a misconception that the wide nine is the attack style defense. And, you know, people have simplified it to say you, you tackle the running back on the way to sacking the quarterback, You, you know, it's not true. You watch the film. Fletcher Cox is, a, is an excellent run defender. And there are times when we two gap, even though it's a, a one gap scheme primarily, there are times when they show patience. You know, those guys are good run defenders. And I think Javon Hargrave will very much in that mold. These guys aren't the, the fly up the field kind of, you know, Michael Bennett's or Vinnie Curry's or, you know, forget it. Darwin Walker is going back old school where they were just like, I'm going after the quarterback and not even worrying about the running back. These guys are good, strong run defenders. And I think it's a big part of the defensive line philosophy. So yeah, it, 
the lack of linebacker talent might burn us a little bit, but um, but I think it would have to be a real breakdown on the defensive line for that to become a true liability as a run defense. Yeah, I think I, I think the best defensive end I could ever think of that was Jason Babin. Talk about a guy who, yeah. uh, <laughs> who did not want to play the run match. That guy loved uh, looking at the sack title at the end of the year, didn't he? Yeah, I think you're right, actually. I think actually, when I wrote about Barnett and as I write about Sweat, one thing I will say is that I think um, it's a bit of a stupid word sometimes, competitiveness, because every football player is competitive. But I think some... Uh, do show a little bit sort of they're more willing to get down and dirty and I think Barnett sometimes too much dirty uh, should we say but I think Sweat's the same actually I think they're very competitive and on running plays they're not brilliant I think Barnett's actually a pretty good run defender I think underrated run defender Um, he's very willing to sort of do the hard work he's very willing to sort of go straight in and sort of put his body on the line etc etc but like you said I think just the Eagles defensive line in general are very good against the run um, they're very competitive guys Graham is I think just an unbelievably good run defender I'm sure I'm not breaking any uh, news when I say that but I think he's so so powerful and strong for a defensive end it'll be interesting because like you I wonder if they'll move the, the four around a little bit as you said because there is a bit of a you almost can't see Malik Jackson or Hargrave not playing that much because they're obviously so talented so I wonder if we'll see uh, something different there. Um, on to the back end. I think we've covered the linebackers in front. Of I've got a couple of things up before we wrap up. Um, the Eagles have not had a good number one quarterback for uh, a long, long time. I think that's been obvious. And I think they've sort of coped without one. Um, I think Darius Slade, there's question marks about whether he was worth uh, the contract. Uh, how long he'll be good for, I think is a very fair question because you see players decline at a certain age. But I think it's pretty safe to say, and I'd be surprised, he's n- um, I'd be very surprised if he's not an above average or very, very good cornerback. And I think Pro Football Focus had him something like uh, 80th best cornerback last year. And of course, anyone that knows the biggest problem with PFF is just no context in those grades. So Darius Slay had an incredibly hard job last year because not only is he tracking number one receivers around the field, that means going into the slot and manning up Keenan Allen, which is pretty much as hard as it gets. Um, the other issue he has is that the Lions' pass rush wasn't very good. So not only are you manning up with a defender or a wide receiver who's elite for um, the whole game, you're also doing it with a good pass rush. So, of course, your numbers aren't going to be great. Um, but I don't think it's breaking news to say that Slay is a very good player. I think he'll fit in very well here. I guess my argument or my point, my question to you is, do you think he'll change anything schematically? So a lot of this podcast is around the Eagles scheme. Schultz has obviously pl- coached under very good quarterbacks before, uh, before, but recently we've seen him basically dealing with quarterbacks that, in all honesty, are replacement level. I think that, say, as we were being nice, um, Mills, Douglas, Sidney Jones, um, they've not been very good. Um, Ronald Darby's probably the most talented guy he's had here, and he had weaknesses, um, unfortunately, as well, especially towards the end of his career. So do you think schematically the addition of Slay will do anything different? Uh, do you expect him to travel, for example? I know it's very difficult to see because we haven't seen it in recent years, but what do you think he can bring to the Eagles' defense that we haven't seen uh, in recent years? Yeah, I mean, uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think the thing about Darius Slay is, is you know, I think when they first made the move, um, I was kind of like, okay, you know, didn't love the compensation, didn't love the contract, you know, given where the Eagles are as a team, you know, you could argue that, but I, I tend not to like get too caught up in that stuff and try to look at it, you know, more. I'm a fan of watching football on the field and, and what impact it makes. And, you know, I'll give a shout out to Jimmy Kemsky on Philly voice. He put up a really nice piece. I think yesterday where he basically did a lot of work and cut up all of Slay's targets in, in last season. And I mean, I don't know how you can watch that cut up and not come away extremely impressed with, the man coverage skills, the stickiness. We haven't had a cornerback like that in a very, very long time. Like Asante Samuel probably, and Asante was probably more of a zone corner than a man corner for sure. But like, as far as a sticky man to man corner, you might have to go all the way back to Troy Vincent to think about like, when is, when we, we had someone that can play like that. Uh, Super impressive. So there's no question he's going to improve the defense, um, you know, for the next couple of years, as far as changes, I mean, uh, he's obviously excels as a man corner. That's something that the lions, you know, rely heavily on under Matt Patricia, kind of that new England influence. Um, You know, uh, I think also Shio Kapadia did a nice analytical deep dive on the athletic and put shared some stats about how actually how well the Eagles did in man coverage last year versus zone coverage. So I think there's there's definitely you're going to see a trend of more man coverage. I don't think that's any surprise. And Slay uh, having Slay will be consistent with that. You'd hate to see him, you know, playing primarily zone. Um, you know, so I think it, at the end of the day, you know, it goes back to that that comment about the defensive line and the pass rush as well. Is ultimately you want your defensive philosophy 
in the front four to marry the coverage that you play. So if you're a zone, if you're a blitzing team and you're doing lots of blitzing, then you're likely going to play a lot more zone on the back end where your DBs can sit back, keep their eyes on the quarterback, break on the ball, cause turnovers. If you're a defense that wants to pressure with four, which we know and we've discussed Schwartz wants to do, then, you know, man coverage is probably better because you want the quarterback to hold that ball. You want, you want DBs to stick. You want them to hold the ball so the front four can get there and make negative plays. So I definitely think you'll see a lot more man coverage. Uh, I think Slay is a great acquisition for that for that reason. The other small thing I'll mention about Slay uh, and the technique is, again, watching that cut up that Jimmy did. I mean, one thing that's a subtlety, but it's so impressive when you watch him is watch him right out of the break while while the he's up in man coverage, press coverage. The wide receiver starts to do his little dance to try to beat that press coverage. Slay's like a statue. He doesn't move until the wide receiver starts breaking downfield. And he has the athleticism and confidence not to get burned on that initial move. Most corners panic immediately in press coverage, and they start following the hip movements of the wide receiver. Slay, it's, it's, it's surreal watching him. It's almost like he's just standing in place, dragging back, and then boom, he's gone. And then before you know it, he's like right on the hip of the, of the wide receiver down the field. So super impressed with him as a player. There's no way it can't have a huge impact. I mean, and furthermore, as far as trailing the wide receivers, it's been a frustration for me for years that we haven't seen more of the Eagles taking whoever their best corner is and, and following receivers. I'd be shocked if if the philosophy doesn't change there and Slay doesn't follow guys like he did in Detroit. I mean, you have to look farther than look at what the what the Eagles did, um, what teams did to the Eagles last year. Like if you look at single wide receiver performance, how many wide receivers had more than 150 yards receiving against the Eagles last year? That game against Miami doesn't happen, and I know it's just Miami. That doesn't happen if you have Darius Slay on your team. I'm sorry, Devontae Parker doesn't do that to to a Darius Slay. I mean, he might get him, burn him a couple times, but he doesn't do that. And I think in some ways, the second half of the season, whatever Schwartz did, they did get better on the back end um, for whatever reason. And even in the playoffs, they were better on the back end. But if you look back to the first half of the season, and I remember around the trade deadline and everybody wanted Ramsey and all the noise. Of course, you want who doesn't want Jalen Ramsey? But at that point in time, it was so obvious that, and this was before the wide receiver injury started to pile up, it was so obvious that cornerback was a huge weakness on this team. So the fact that they filled that, I mean, you know, having, losing Malcolm Jenkins is a bit of a trade-off there. Uh, but but um, but Slay, you know, as long as he can stay healthy, um, you know, at least for the next one to two years, he'll make a pretty substantial impact on this defense. Yeah, that's really interesting because me and Connor um, spoke about the safety position last week and we literally said the podcast is now, yes, people have heard it, but we literally said the exact same thing. Uh, we do wonder if Mills will end up moving up outside because there are huge question marks there and we were discussing how it could be like a matchup thing. I, I mean, w- when we comment on leadership and smart, I have no idea how you judge this, but I get the feeling that Mills is a pretty smart guy in terms of understanding some coverages and I wouldn't be surprised if he's the kind of guy that can play outside one week in a specific matchup or even move mid-game and then go back into the slot to do the sort of Jenkins role um, sort of during the game. I think he's quite a smart uh, player in that sense. So I think he could do a most a multiple roles but I agree with you I don't think you're going to replace Jenkins um as simply as that you're not just going to put Mills there and go right we're sorted now um yeah I think uh you know you mentioned it durability you can't substitute that it's unlikely you're going to find another no matter who you get to replace him you're not going to see that durability and that is that is an underrated piece uh, I mean you only notice it when guys are missing and out of the lineup a lot and then you 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 obsess about it to say this guy's injury prone, but whenever a guy is steady and always there, I mean, you can't overlook that to have, especially in an important position like safety and, you know, he's a leader of the defense. The fact he's not missing a game or a snap is absolutely critical. The leadership piece also absolutely critical. I think the Eagles have other leaders on the team that can step up and, and do things, but I think Malcolm is just one of those really special guys that, you know, I think we'll really miss uh, just because, you know, there's there's leaders that say things and, and, and Malcolm's a great leader, you know, from by all accounts in the way that he he holds himself accountable in press conferences and in interviews after games. He, he's, he's not afraid to take the blame, all that stuff. He's a leader by example. You know, he plays special teams. He makes plays on special teams. He he does practice reps on special teams like 
you know, he's the total package as far as it comes from leadership. So, you know, sometimes I think leadership can be a little bit overrated, but I think when you have a guy like Malcolm, who's the total package in every way, shape or form, I mean, I think if you go back and look at, I want to say there was a film session, the NFL game pass does these film sessions. And I think there was one with Malcolm where he was talking about, I think it was tracking the 2017 season, but it might've been the 2018 season, but he just goes over like a handful of plays where someone on the defense really screwed up. And he just erased that mistake because he's just so smart. He knows where to be. Those are the things that you're not going to replace with Malcolm Jenkins. Uh, all that being said, uh, one of my favorite Eagles ever. I hated that they let him go. You know, it's a shame. But, you know, to look at the flip side, I mean, if you really watch Malcolm Jenkins and you watch the type of player he is. Now, whether this is the way that Schwartz deployed him or whether it was a sign of some of the limitations Malcolm was having as he aged, you know, if you look at him last year, he's not really a he's not really a safety anymore. And maybe it's because you have a, a free safety like Roddy McLeod, who is a, you know the deep safety. That's his role. You wouldn't expect him to play in the box. And maybe it's just a, a, a decision of that's how you wanted to play Malcolm. But he really was an extra linebacker, and he's a corner that you line up on the slot receiver, or you match up in man coverage on a tight end or a running back. That's where his value is. So I think that you know we might see some some changes in, in some of the coverages that uh, Schwartz will play. I think he's still going to be a single high guy. So I think what you're going to see is I personally feel, and maybe I have too much confidence in the acquisition. And the fact that it's only a one year deal makes me skeptical. I think Will Parks will be the guy that ends up replacing Malcolm. I think we'll end up seeing Jalen go back to the outside and play corner. Could be wrong, but I think that'll happen. Or at the same time, maybe they'll mix it up a little bit because I think Jalen could be a guy that you could use to cover cover in the slot a little bit, or you could match up against a tight end or a or a running back. He, he's definitely not the ideal outside corner, but I think there's a, some big question marks on the outside outside of Slay, so you might absolutely need to bring Jalen back there. So I look for Will Parks to maybe be the guy that surprises some people because a lot of people are expecting Jalen to be the Malcolm replacement. I wouldn't be surprised if Will Parks is the guy not saying he's going to replace him in any way, shape or form, but he has the skills to play that role that Malcolm's played. He won't play it as well, but maybe he's one of those guys that, you know, wins the starting job is playing that role um, is doing a lot of things Malcolm was doing. And maybe he's one of those guys you see extended in season uh, because it was only a one year deal. Yeah, see, I'll be honest. I'm the I'm the exact same as you. Sorry, Connor. I'll let you go. Uh, just one last thing. I mean, I think I think I'm done. I think I've taken up enough of your time. But I I love Jalen Mills, and it's a really weird thing. I can't explain why. I don't particularly uh, like you said. He's he's not a good enough athlete. It's just facts. He's not. He can't run as an outside cornerback. It's unfortunately. It's. I wish it wasn't the case. You can't teach speed. Um. And Razzle Douglas can't run, and I've never liked him. I hated Razzle Douglas pre-draft. Unfortunately, I don't like him as a player. There's just something about Mills. I don't know why. Um. But I think like you, he has a knack for doing the right thing and I've seen him have games where he's covered Julio like reasonably well he's been okay I know Beckham I think the guy can play I think Schwartz loves him and I think they will find a role with him in the defense and I think uh, sometimes I mean Connor spoke about this a lot of air not everyone can be a star not everyone in the defense can be an unbelievable athlete and be like the best player in the world sometimes you just need every defense to have the occasional player who the coaches love the players around him love and he does a job for you and I think Mills would be that kind of sort of handyman that will fill in uh, in a number of different roles uh sorry Connor, what were you gonna ask about that yeah that's what i was gonna ask you next is uh how do you expect the eagles to fill malcolm chicken's role i know there's a lot of leadership there and really their most consistent defender who hasn't uh been off the field for a snap the last two seasons how do you think they cope with the, his loss on the defense some guys just have it right and mills is that guy i mean the one thing we do know about uh, jalen mills that is an absolute fact is he's not a great athlete for an outside corner, but yet he's been able to play outside corner on a Super Bowl team. And, and, you know, when I said earlier that, you know, somehow Schwartz managed to get more out of the, out of the secondary in the second half of the season, well, that coincides with Jalen Mills coming back. So, so, you know, he's just one of those guys, you know, that, uh, you know, doesn't have the prerequisite talent. It's why he was a seventh round pick, uh, but just gets the job done. And, and, you know, that's probably why Schwartz likes him so much. So uh, yeah, you, you'll see them use him pretty creatively, I hope, but uh, I like him. I like him as a player and uh, he's a fun personality as well. I just think they, with letting Malcolm go, because I agree, it's going to be a tough loss to come over, especially with, I mean, durability and being on the field the most along the defense. That's pretty much your defensive captain the last couple of years. Uh, they value quantity over the quality in that instance. And, they turned his salary into so many of these players like Will Parks, as you mentioned, 
Uh, but I, that's why I kind of like that, though, that they have so many uh, guys that they can deploy and do the – like now we have something to debate about with all the versatility of uh, how they can go up against certain matchups and how they can use guys in certain packages. And not only that, I agree with you. Will Parks I, – I think Will Parks is a pretty good dime linebacker. He shared that in Denver. Uh, I it, I think he answered some of my linebacker questions for me if the Eagles decide to go ahead and move forward with him. I just don't – knowing Jim Schwartz and knowing Jalen Mills and how he's been a consistent starter for him, I, I, I envision that they give him every opportunity to replace Malcolm Jenkins but have the guy waiting in the wings if he's not able to do so. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. And I think that um, – yeah, I think – you know, it'll be it'll be interesting to watch, but uh, you know, and I agree with you. It's interesting the volume approach that the Eagles have taken at two of those key questionable positions of wide receiver and corner, is they've kind of carpet bombed those two positions uh, in, in the last couple of months. In the sense that I've seen it suggested, uh, you know, that you know, assuming Rager's good, because if Rager's wrong, if he's the wrong guy and he doesn't work out, then. Yeah, it, it, it's a, it's big trouble for the Eagles. But assuming he's okay, then really all you need is one of Goodwin, you know, Hightower or Quez Watkins, or even with one of those guys pans out to be something that you can depend on, then you're pretty good at the position. And then on the flip side, on the corner side of things, you, in the secondary side of things, you lose Malcolm. Huge loss. No one's going to say any, any any other way, or they're or they're crazy. But the fact that you know you've got you've got options. They're not the the sexiest of options, but you've got like. You know, can Park step up? Can Mills step up? You brought in Nikel Roby, Roby Coleman, uh, who's been a you know a good nickel corner, a good slot corner in his career, and you also have a guy like Crevion LeBlanc, which again, Cravon, like I, he's a player I actually quite like, but he's uh, just can't stay healthy. So, so there's there's some volume there, and um, at both of those positions. So, you know, it could go horribly wrong, but I mean, if you get two of those guys right at both of those positions to be able to be true contributors. And, you know, all of a sudden this team looks a lot better. Yeah, no, I think it's really interesting. It's something we spoke about last time. I think the difference with obviously cornerback and wide receiver is called about they have a proven star like Slayer wide receiver. They're going to heavily rely on Jackson to stay healthy and Rager to be uh, any good. But anyway, I think that's all of the questions. Before I leave it to Connor to sign off because he's good at that stuff and he'll say things that I'll forget to say. Uh, I'm sure, Ryan, I haven't asked you this, but you'll be back at some point because I will make sure you're back at some point. But before you go, is there any sort of final thoughts you have on the Eagles or anything you haven't discussed that you want to mention uh, before we finish up? I don't think so. I think this has been pretty comprehensive and thanks for letting me ramble on for a bit. Uh, you can tell it's, it's quarantine and, and we're isolated because, uh, you know, this was, this was some good medicine to just, uh, get on, get on the phone and chat, chat Eagles for over an hour. So it's a pleasure. Thanks for the invite guys. And yeah, more than happy to do some more in the future. It's been, it's been great, but, uh, no, I think we've covered everything and, uh, nothing I can think of off the top of my head. Yeah. I thought it was a great episode. Uh, I, I think we really discussed the concepts well and got into, I, I feel like I understand this, the team more going into the season now, so I think it's going to be a great episode for the listeners to uh, to soak in. Ryan, I, I, I greatly appreciate you coming on the Eagles Brawl. Uh, make sure everybody's to subscribe, leave those five-star uh, ratings because it helps us get more acclimated in the podcast. You'll start trending a little bit. Almost 1K downloads in only three episodes in so far. This will probably be the fifth by the time it drops. Greatly appreciate you guys all tuning in. Greatly appreciate Ryan coming on the show. Johnny, glad to talk football with you as always. Yeah, it's up to you guys. But, yeah, no, thanks thanks for the invite, guys. It was, it was fun.